Well, hey, I want to share um, from the Bible with you this morning, if that's okay. Is that cool? Hey, where's, where's Singapore at again? Where's, where's Singapore at again? Those are the best people in the world right there. It's, I love you guys. You're amazing. Matthew chapter 20. Would you go there? Matthew's gospel, chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to read this uh, pretty well-known parable that Jesus tells. We'll read about 16 verses, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. You alive? Responsive? Come on. Matthew chapter 20. Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and, and whatever is right, I'll, I'll give you. So they went. Again, he went out in about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said, well, no one's hired us. He said, well, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when, in, when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, now call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. When those came who he had hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. When the first came, they supposed they would receive more, and they likewise each received a denarius. When they had received it, they complained against the landowner and said, these last men have worked only one hour and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things or is your eye evil? because I am good. So the last will be first, Jesus says, and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. Would you go to one more verse with me? I, I, I lied, I said we'd only read Matthew 20, but Ephesians chapter three. This is such a good passage, Ephesians chapter three. I'll start reading in verse 14. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever and all God's people said, Amen. come on, is that not good? Why well, do drugs when you can do scripture? I want to... Um, I want to title this, this talk this morning, and I'm going, to, I'm going to give it a, I'm going to, the title of this talk is going to be the only point that I'm going to give you. So I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the zenith of my message right here and right now. This is, this is the whole premise. This is the thesis. This is it. And here's the title. Don't take what's yours. Don't take what's yours. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, don't take it? Now turn to your second choice and say, you, you, you don't take it either. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your presence. Thank you for grace and wisdom. Help us, Holy Spirit, to see Jesus. That's what we need. We know if we'll see Jesus, we'll, we'll never be the same again. We will be like him. Thank you for your grace, and Lord, bring back the Seattle Supersonics. In Jesus' name, everybody said. 
My wife of 13 years, we have a, uh, we have a, a contest in our marriage. It's kind of an unspoken contest, but it's very legitimate. It's very authentic. It's very real. We, we, again, we've not really verbalized it, but, but this contest is, well, it, it, it happens anytime we have an argument, anytime we have a fight, which of course only happens about once a, a day. And, um, well, don't judge me. And, uh, so we'll be like right in the heat of the moment, you know, and Chelsea's very emotional and outspoken and I, uh, my disposition is a little bit more meek, mild and Christ-like, but we'll be, <laughs> shut up, just shut up. But, so we'll be like in the heat of the moment, you know, and like veins popping and, and I'm just like, really, this is ridiculous. And, and then the contest goes a little bit something like this. The contest is whoever, in the middle of a fight, during a fight, after a fight, whoever says, will you forgive me first wins and is officially the most spiritual person of the day <laughs> yeah that's the way my dad taught me okay the sun cannot go down on your wrath so like my big sister um i mean she's older than me she's not big but she, so we would we would like get in fights and stuff and so we couldn't go to bed until where there was resolution and so we'd have to say will you forgive me and then dad made us kiss so we stopped fighting if you know what i mean so So Chelsea and I will be fighting, and truth is, she typically wins the contest. She, and I know you're shocked at that. <laughs> and so we'll be like, but, but I don't feel like Chelsea fights fair. That, that's my issue. I don't like how she how she does this contest. I don't, I don't, I, I don't like it. So like we'll be fighting and I'll be like, I mean, veins popping. I'll be at a high octave. I'll be like, I just don't stand. It's so frustrating, you know? And she will just, she'll just drop in. Will you forgive me? And I'll be like, too soon. <laughs> hey, no, I mean, yes, I will. But hold on a minute. You can't just drop will you forgive me we are not done working this out i don't think it's fair i don't think it's right she just gets to hurt me and belittle me and then say will you forgive me and everything's supposed to be honky dory peaches and cream it's like please woman you hurt me i'm gonna hurt you and then i'll forgive you yeah yeah I'm down here, I'm in pain, I'm in a dark place, I'm going to bring you down to where I am and you're going to have to wallow and grovel and feel the pain you inflicted on me and then I will forgive you. <laughs> yeah, don't judge me. I'm being honest here, okay? I know it's sadistic, I know it's sinister, I know it's dark, but it's real. I don't, I don't want to just say... Oh, I forgive you. Yeah. No, I'm hurt. You don't know what you put me through, woman. And I want you to feel the pain I feel. And then I will willingly, graciously, and generously forgive you. You are absolved. Anybody else? Can you kind of relate? Can you cut? Good, three of you. Fantastic, thanks. <laughs> Good night, God bless. And I mean, really? It's, the truth is, it's like, it's kind of a human tendency. It's pretty indicative of our human condition. We, we want justice, of course, when it serves us. And then we want grace when justice doesn't serve us. Hello? I'm one of those people, like I want, like I want what's fair, you know? I'm an American for crying out loud. I, I want, I'm proud to be an American where at least I know things are fair. I mean, I want it to be fair. This, this value system, this, this paradigm, this perspective that many of us have as human beings on planet Earth does not serve us well when we begin to follow Jesus. 
does not serve us very well when we enter into his domain called a kingdom. Every king has a kingdom, and you can't have a kingdom without a king. God is king. Jesus is king, and he has a domain. He has a rule. He has a reign. He has a culture. And Peter opens his big mouth right before we get what we now call Matthew chapter 20 in this parable we just read. And he says, Jesus, I got a quick question. Uh, we've pretty much left everything. What are we going to get for that? Like, I need to know because, like, I'm really, I mean, I left my whole fishing business, and it was pretty good. And, I mean, things were really looking up, and I left it all for you. So what are you going to do for me? Jesus says, guys, um, let, me, let me give you a metaphor. Let me, because I don't, I don't know if you're understanding how, how I think, how God thinks. So let me... Um, to, to kind of explain what God's domain is like, what his culture's like, uh, let me, um, let's see, let me tell you a story. There's this, there's this landowner, he has a vineyard. Now, by the way, so far so good, okay? God is likened to a landowner with a vineyard. Hello, party, okay? So, this is good. People go to vineyards for celebrations and parties. So, so far, so good. Love the metaphor, okay? Love the parable. He says, so there's this, this landowner, he's, he's got a vineyard, and he wants to hire day workers, Okay, guys? Like, yeah, cool. So he, he goes early to the city square, and he finds, you know, a group, of, a group of dudes to hire. So he hires them first thing in the morning. Now, throughout the day, he goes back to the city square. Jesus tells the parable. We will notice that five employee groups are hired, five employee groups. Now, only one of the employee groups will actually have a contract. Only one. It's the earliest group. They will actually sign a contract. They will agree on a particular pay. They will agree that they will work 12 hours for one denarius. They sign on the dotted line. There is a binding agreement. Now, the next four employee groups, you, you, you will notice in our reading today that when they were hired, all the landowners said was what? Whatever is right, I'll give you. And they were like, cool, I'm just glad to be hired. I'm in, let's do it. I'll trust you. So they work all day. Now, so far, the, the, the metaphor is great. So far, the parable, everything's fine. Until Jesus says, now the landowner, it gets to the end of the work day, and he calls his steward, and he says, all right, let's, let, let's pay the employees. He says, but hold on real quick. Uh, today, let's pay them different. Let's pay them backwards. Let's pay, let's pay the last group we hired first and so on. Cool? Now, this is, this is unorthodox. This isn't normal. You, the first group you would hire, particularly because they're under contract, you would pay them first, and then you would go all the way down to the fifth and final employee group who only worked one lousy little hour. The landowner says to the steward, now, now go ahead and pay the first last. So, I can kind of see the scene. They're all lined up, all five employee groups. We're not sure how many. Is there five, six, seven, ten guys in each employee group? I'm not sure. And they're standing there, and the steward comes up to the first group who've worked one hour, and he drops them a denarius. So down here, meanwhile, down at the first group who have contract, they're looking down going, hello, we're about to get paid. <laughs> okay? Why? Because they think in terms of fairness, equality. Justice. I'm a human being. So, as it happens, the second employee group and the third and fourth until finally it gets, the steward is in front of the first employee group who have contract. Now, what's amazing to me is that this first group didn't notice the trend. <laughs> one denarius, one denarius, one denarius, one denarius. But, you know, we always think it's going to be different for me. And it should be different for me. So the steward comes and he's like, yeah, I appreciate everything you guys did today. Here's your denarius according to the contract, right? And they are flabbergasted. <laughs> really? Oh, come on. You made those guys equal to us? So hold on a second. Wait a minute. Didn't you have a contract? Isn't this exactly what you signed up for? Right? They're, 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 they're beside themselves. Why? Because this is not logical. This doesn't make any sense. These guys 
worked one hour, probably not even a full hour because I hired him at the 11th hour and the 12th hour, so they probably only got a good solid 35 minutes in. And they get a denarius and we bear the heat of the Middle Eastern sun for 12 hours and you gonna walk up here and give me a denarius, please. Now, we read stories like this and we're like, wow, are they not selfish? Come on, guys. We are these guys. Just FYI. This is how we think. This isn't... This isn't fair, God. Shouldn't I be? Lord, I don't know if you noticed. I logged a solid 38 minutes in quiet time this morning. Hello. And then I've noticed, I've noticed, I've noticed how God does this. Just like the landowner said to the steward. See, there would be no problem in this parable at all had they been paid in a normal way. Right? There would be no drama. Because the contractual group would have took their denarius and been like, please. And they would have never known. But the landowner, he's got issues. <laughs> he won't do it on purpose. He said, let's just frustrate him. <laughs> just pay him. Yeah. I am convinced God will bless other people in front of you on purpose. Yeah. Like, has God ever blessed you and you were so happy when he blessed you until he blessed somebody else more? <laughs> like, I was so, like, God, you finally gave us a cat. We've wanted a pet for so long. This is awesome. But John got a car, God. <laughs> I got a cat. And John got a car. You know how happy we'd be if we didn't have inside information on our fellow Christians, neighbors, and friends? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? All of a sudden, we're like, oh, we're just petting the little cat, like so happy about the cat. And then John comes along with his testimony. <laughs> hey, man, good to see you. Man, you never believe God blessed me with a car. He blessed you with what? Man, sh come on, man. <laughs> Stupid. Man, you only been saved like six years. I got a solid 13. And you get the car? Like, we all know that like the way God functions in his kingdom is uniquely peculiar to the way you and I process here on this planet. You, you all, we know this, right? But I think sometimes we get really hung up on the kingdom culture. Because we think in terms of what I have earned, what I deserve, the hours I have logged. God, do you know what I have done? And I'm just here to say, you don't want to go down that dark alley. You don't want to go down that dark road because it is lonely and eventually you'll actually figure out what you really deserve. And what you and I deserve, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. So let's just all agree to stop thinking in terms of what we deserve, deal? Life with Jesus is better when you forget what you think you deserve. You know, we, we read these, these Bible parables and we're like, oh, this is beautiful. You know, like Luke, Luke 15, for instance, it's a classic, you know, parable. It's these three parables that Jesus tells and basically is an explanation of why he hangs out with bad peoples and sinners and the religious people don't understand it. And so he says, well, let me tell you a story. There's this, there's this shepherd and there's this woman. The shepherd's got sheep. Obviously, the woman's got a coin collection. And there's this dad and he's got two sons. And so he tells this story and he's trying to explain, like, here's what I'm about. Here's how I think. Here's what. And he tells these stories. And it's funny because we read these stories and we're like, oh, isn't this beautiful? But it's not, it's not so much beautiful as it is 
ridiculous. You know, like Luke, Luke 15, for instance, it's a classic you know, parable. It's these three parables that Jesus tells and basically is an explanation of why he hangs out with bad peoples and sinners and the religious people don't understand it. And so he says, well, let me tell you a story. There's this, there's this shepherd and there's this woman. The shepherd's got sheep. Obviously, the woman's got a coin collection. And there's this dad. And he's got two sons. And so he tells this story and he's trying to explain, like, here's what I'm about. Here's how I think. Here's what. And he tells these stories. And it's funny because we read these stories. and We're like, oh, isn't this beautiful? But it's not, it's not so much beautiful as it is ridiculous. For instance, the first story is like, so there's this shepherd, he's got like a hundred sheep, right? And he, uh, he counts his flock one day and he's like, oh, weird, we only have 99. And so it's like, I wonder where the one went. Now, look, I'm not quick with math. I'm not the sharpest Crayola in the box, okay? But I know that 99 is a much greater sum than one. And if, I, if I've got 100 and I lose one, I still got 99. I'm going to cut my losses. Is that fair? Is that, is that, is that all right? Like 99, we're still good. One is one, you know? Oh, well, besides the fact sheep are dumb, right? It's his own sheep's fault. Wanderer. But no, no, no. Jesus says God's like a shepherd. He's got a hundred sheep. He counts up and he realizes he, he's got one gone, so he, he risks 99 for one. God's math is not effective. What are we talking about? I want to I want to ask who's with the 99? Are we are we are we putting in jeopardy the greater sum for one? The next the next story gets even crazier because there's a woman, she has a coin collection, she counts her coins and realizes that she had 10, now she only has 9. Now again, 9 is still a greater sum than 1. Now she the Bible says she's thro the, the original language speaks that she kind of throws up house. I mean, she's throwing couch cushions. She's doing everything. And I, I, it begs to ask, where's the, where's the coin collection? Did she put it in the safe? There's no indication of that. She's throwing cushions everywhere. Have we put the nine in a particular place where we can relocate them? I don't know. It gets weirder. She finds the one. We never hear again about the nine. And when she finds the one coin, she throws a party that costs more than the coin she found. We read these stories, we're like, oh, isn't God amazing? What? Two plus two evidently is not four with God. And then, and then for the grand finale of how God thinks and how God processes God's mindset in terms of people and life on this planet, he says, there's this dad and he's got two boys and the younger one is an idiot. And he asks for his inheritance early, and he goes and lives in these crazy cities, and he blows all of his dad's hard-earned money. So, he's a human, so he thinks in terms of what I earn and what I deserve. So he has completely given up. He believes he has completely abdicated his right as a son. Now, he's just wanting to be an employee. So you know the story, he prepares a speech because he's going to come back and just try to get a job. He just wants his dad to be his employer. But when he gets back to dad's house, dad runs to him, starts kissing him, and gives him jewelry, gives him new clothes, and, and, and fixes filet mignon. It gets worse. And then has a DJ come in and has a dance party. Like, is this son like a war hero, or is he an idiot? What are we, t like, we're giving him a ticker tape parade? Does anyone have a problem with this? Like, the story goes on, tells about the older son. And in Christendom, we're like, that older son, what a sour, bad guy. He's the only logical person in the story. <laughs> At least he has enough sense to come back to the house. And the Bible says he literally heard music and dancing. Friends, when you can hear dancing afar off, People are getting down. Okay? This is beyond electric slide. I mean, these people are getting busy on the dance floor. He can hear the pitter pat of dancing. Naturally, he's, he's completely undone. He won't even go in the house. And we make this guy out to be 
mean. He's not mean. He's just reasonable. Now, when I heard that, I thought to myself, how long between when the son came home and said, Dad, could, do you got a spot on your like, a team? Maybe I could be an employee. And he, he's probably smelly and in rags. And how long from that point where he's begging for a job is he on the dance floor celebrating? Like, was that an hour? Was it two? I'll give you two hours. He, he, he probably had to shower, put some new clothes on, but he's not a girl. It didn't take that long. <laughs> I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. The dad's like, okay, here's your clothes. Go get changed. Why, dad? Because I love you. And then, by the way, I got your favorite DJ coming in. Got all your friends coming over. It's going to be great. I mean, I want you to think, you're the, you're the, you're the son. You've come out of the shower. You just kind of fix yourself up, and you're, like, walking out to the barn where the dance party is, and... All your friends are like, hey, man! You're like, am I getting punked? Like, is this a joke? <laughs> DJ starts spinning your favorite tune, and all your friends, like, circle up. They're like, you yeah, go! And you're like, woo! This is crazy! Yeah! All right! What are we doing? <laughs> when we read these stories, we're like, isn't God amazing? Yeah, but kind of kind of wild, not really logical, that would be the gospel. Let me ask you something, why is that kid dancing? There's only one explanation, is he dancing because of his performance, is he dancing because of his lifestyle, is he dancing because of his resume? The only reason that kid can dance is one, because the father loves him. Now what's going to happen in life? is you're going to run into people who are dancing that shouldn't be dancing. And you're going to want to cut the music and be like, really? But I've discovered something. I don't know if it's all accurate and right, but I've learned something with God. If you find somebody that shouldn't be dancing, but they dancing, just dance with them. If you've got to close your eyes real tight, that's fine. But what you don't want to do is be on the outside looking in. Get in on the dance party and celebrate God's goodness. Just, 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 get, just get, even if, you know, he's over here, you just be like, this is crazy. I, I don't, don't even like that guy. No way he should be dancing. This is crazy. You're good to see me. What's up? All right. Don't be that guy. What is this, man? Really? Are we going to continue to persist in terms of what we deserve and what we've earned and what we've Boy, it'll, what a hindrance that will be in our journey with Jesus. Life comes down to two choices. See, when the, the final group, which was the first group that was hired under contract, when they expressed their disdain and disgust, the landowner, the landowner's reply is revealing. He said, okay, okay. Listen, he says, take what's yours and go your way. Friends with God, life will come down to two choices. You either take what you believe is yours, what you've earned, or what you have so-called deserved, or you simply trust what he gives. Life comes down. <laughs> now, let me just play with this metaphor. If I was the contract group, and I witnessed what I just witnessed, when the steward came down and probably some of the landowners watching, and when he paid me the equal denarius, I would have said this. Okay? Okay. I got a quick question, sir, before we take off. Are, are you hiring again tomorrow? <laughs> you are? Really? Well, look, the whole day I'm pretty busy, but the last hour I'm available, so I'm going to come on back. <laughs> Enjoy the kingdom, friend. But you can't even see the opportunity they have. Why? Envy, entitlement, justice, fairness. Hey, stop for a minute and enjoy the benefits. Because you could be that guy tomorrow. I'm convinced God will have you here sometimes. <laughs> Woo, I love the gospel. I'm blessed. 
and I'll have you here sometimes. Really? Really? Huh. I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to gossip or nothing. I'm just saying, man, I don't know if you know about that guy because, I mean, I'm just saying we should probably pray, you know, for him because he ain't right, man. I mean, things are not, I mean, it's cool, whatever. Like, I'm glad God blessed him and everything. I'm just saying. And you will be repeatedly tempted throughout your life. Moments will come. Seasons will come. And you will have the option to take what you think is yours. I'm go God, this, this is not what I, I'm just going to. And my whole message is as a friend and a Christian, I'm coming inside in this situation. And I'm just saying for real, just a quick minute. Don't take what's yours. Don't, don't. You ever seen those game shows? Where they're like, you can have what's in front of you. It's right there. You can see it. Or you can take what's behind door number one. What are you going to do? And everyone's like, consternation. Oh, God. Oh, it's, this is great, too. You know, and what if it's on that door? I don't even know. Oh, this is crazy. I'm thinking about it. No, I'm not going to take it. Oh, maybe I should. I don't. Oh, I mean, it could be a car. Uh -huh. <laughs> With God, there's always an element of faith. It's unavoidable. There's going to be moments and seasons in your life where you can take what you think is yours. He'll let you. Or you can take what's behind door number God. And I'm just saying, I implore you by the Holy Spirit to choose door number God every time. Trust him. That's what it comes down to, isn't it? Do we trust him? Do we trust who he is? See, God always acts in consistency with the contents of his character. He cannot go outside that. So if we understand who he is, then we understand always how he will function. God does not do more. God is more. It's who he is. <laughs> Woo! Ephesians 3 starts talking about the fullness, the width, the height, the length, the depth of his love. It's talking about the essence of God, the fullness of God, the weight of God, the, 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 the essence of who our God is. And it says now in light of who he is and his fullness and his love, which is unsearchable and unfathomable and unconditional now in light of his love. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can not just pray about or ask or talk about, but even thoughts that wiggle their way into our minds to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask, think, or even imagine, to Him be the glory. Let's trust our exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can think or ask, God. Don't don't spend another day of your life thinking in terms of what you deserve or what you've earned. It's a dark, bleak, lonely, empty road. Paul said, he said, I'm not ashamed, you know. And I realize more now what Paul was saying when he says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I realize I can get embarrassed sometimes too by the gospel. I can feel a little bit like I want to kind of explain it away. I want to tell people that if you do this, you'll get this. And, but that's not really the gospel. The gospel is a mystery. The gospel is a scandal. The gospel by nature is illogical and things don't always add up. I don't, I don't. And Paul said, I don't understand it. This is what he's trying to say. Someone could come play the piano to make me sound extra spiritual at this particular moment. <laughs> Thank you. When I start whispering, that's usually when I'm trying to be very dramatic. You're awesome. 
I think what Paul is saying is, he's saying, I know, I know what the gospel is, you know. I know that there's going to be days where you don't understand it and I don't understand it, but I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not embarrassed. I think Paul was saying, I don't know why God saved Saul and made him Paul. I don't know why I was the guy that got knocked off his donkey and chosen to be an apostle to the Gentiles. I don't, I don't know. I got no explanation for that. Writing to the church in Rome, I don't, but I'm not ashamed, you know. I won't be embarrassed. Paul later will write to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians. He says, I am who I am by the grace of God. <laughs> the truth about me is no longer based on my performance and my deeds and my pedigree and my past and my present and my resume. That is no longer the truth about me. The truth about me is defined by the gospel. The truth about me is defined by grace. I am who I am that God says I am. I'm not ashamed. And then Paul quotes the Old Testament. In the next verse, in verse 17, he says, you know, the just shall live by faith. And I end here, and, and I end. The just, words that have changed our modern belief system. The just shall live by faith. The last four employee groups in our parable, what, how did they work? They worked on Simply, whatever's right. Whatever's right. Hey, you're right. You're just. You're good. So whatever is right, I trust what comes from your righteous hand. I trust what comes from your good hand. I trust. I will leave justice in your hand. What I believe is just, I yield to you. For the just, you see that justice and faith have now come together. <laughs> and now we can trust God for what is just. I just, like, I want to live my life like the last four employee groups. Is this okay? And maybe this is too simple and maybe there's more to it. But I just kind of want to be one of those guys, one of those Christians, one of those Jesus followers that's just happy to be hired. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need a contract. The contract has been fulfilled. The law has been satisfied. Now I'll just relate to you based on whatever you believe is right. I'm just happy to be on the team. I'm just happy to be in the family. I'm just happy to be saved. I'm just happy to be delivered. I'm just happy to be healed. I'm just happy to be here. I'm just happy. My dad used to say, son, sometimes it's better to be dumb and happy. Yeah. Words to live by. How, how liberated would you live? People getting cars all around you. That's awesome. Can I bring my cat over? Can we ride in your car? <laughs> ah, she's happy. To be in the kingdom. And I trust you, God. And we have every right to believe and anticipate. And Ephesians 3 says we can ask and we can think about and we can imagine and we can anticipate and expect what behind, what's behind door number God. But I'm here to tell you that it will always end in exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask, think, or imagine. Now to Him be glory in the church forever and ever and somebody say amen would you pray with me just close your eyes and
if you're here and you say, Judah, I, uh, I just know God's talking to me. I've been busy thinking in terms of what I've earned, what I've deserved. And today I want to make a decision to live with Jesus on the basis of whatever he says is right. Step into this space of liberty. Step into this space of peace. Step into this space, this space of satisfaction and fulfillment. You're enough, Jesus. You're a good landowner. We love you. If that's you, you know God's talking to you. Would you just shoot up your hand all over the auditorium this morning? Just shoot it up and say, that's me, Holy Spirit. I know you're talking to me. Father, I thank you for the presence and power of your Holy Spirit that is in this arena this morning. And I thank you, you are coming now to remind us of our righteousness and remind us of Jesus. <laughs> Father, I pray we step in to this space. We thank you, Lord. The just shall live by trusting in God. We thank you for it. Thank you for your grace, your beauty, your majesty, your sufficiency. We are who we are today because of the grace of God.